ready to get into the Word of God? Um, I'm going to pray. we got a brand new series. It says it's time to wake up. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come before you today, thank you. Lord, we thank you for your Word. Father, we know that there is so many times in the Bible that you tell us that we need to be awake in these last days. And Father, we don't want to be like the disciples who fell asleep while you were in intercession. Uh, Father, we, we want to be awake. We want to be about doing our Father's business. We want to occupy until you come. And so, Father, we just pray today, open our eyes and our ears. and Let us hear the alarm clock going off. Let us understand the seasons and the times that we're living in right now that you have actually given to us in the Word. Let us understand and know that what we're seeing today has been prophesied, has been spoken about. Only in the Bible and everything that we see is happening in multiples. And I pray today, Father God, that we will leave this place with an urgency on the inside of our heart to see people get saved, to tell people about Jesus, Father God, and to spend our time in prayer and the Word of God so that we will prepare ourselves for your return. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen. Turn to somebody next to you and say, it is time to wake up. If they're sleeping, wake them up. Just shake them a little bit and wake them up. Amen? I want you to turn your Bibles to Romans, the 13th chapter, beginning with verse 11, please. Amen? Romans 13, verse 11. Like I said, we're starting a brand new series. It is time to wake up. And it is time for the church to wake up to the things of God, to wake up to the time, the season that we are living in. In Romans, the 13th chapter, verse 11, it says this, and do this. In other words, this is action. This is not something that we are pass- passive about, but it's something that we do. And do this, knowing the time. Everybody say knowing. Knowing. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer. And when it talks about that salvation, it's talking about the, the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is always right there for anybody to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. But here he's talking about the return of Jesus Christ. He said, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day it is at, at hand. Therefore... Let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Notice who has to cast off and who has to put on. There is a responsibility that we have. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in reverie or drunkenness, not in lewdness or lust or not in strife and envy, but put on, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So Paul is telling us that it is time to wake up. It is time for us to know the time. In other words, he would say this. If, if, if he were talking to us, there was an old cliche that people used to, used to use, and that is, hey, wise up. You know, something's going on, wise up. So the first thing we need to understand concerning that word is Before we even talk about waking up, we need to wise up because of the time that we're living in. The problem with time is that time is so vast in nature. In other words, if you took your car to a mechanic to get it fixed, uh, or you took your car in to get it serviced, uh, you'd walk up, they'd fill out the papers, do whatever they need to do, and then you'd ask this question because you want to know. What, when is my car going to be fixed? Now, if the person on the other side of the service desk said, well, sometime. 
uh, we'll, we'll fix it sometime. Well, no, I'm sorry, that is not an appropriate answer. You need to give me a specific time when I can expect to come and pick up my car. See, time for us, to see, God lives outside of time. God created time. And so we live inside of time. And so what we must do is we must break down time in increments. In other words, we plan our day. Uh, we plan our years. We plan our months. You know, because we break down time in, 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 in days and in years and months and hours and minutes. You know, like people, somebody will just say, hey, you know, you, you, you're on your phone and, and somebody calls and you click over and you say, hey, uh, I'll call you back in a few minutes. I'm on another, another call. Or somebody says, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll meet you in about an hour or so. You know, we, we have to break down time. That's the reason we have day timers. That's the reason we have on our phones. Uh, we, we have it broken down, the day broken down in hours where we can add appointments and do, do things. We can put events on there that, that helps us a lot to keep our appointments and know what time we're supposed to do, do stuff. We have alarms that we can set on there to let us know that within an hour you're supposed to, you're supposed to be at this particular place. But when Paul says, and when Paul says here, he says, and knowing the time, the word time there that he's speaking of is the Greek word keros, K-A-I-R-O-S. And it means this, it's very important. It means a specific time, a set time or a very specific time. It literally means a time that has been set by God. Like the time that God set for the first coming of Jesus Christ. That was prophesied all through the Old Testament. And Isaiah and other, other uh, prophets that are there testifying not only that Jesus was, was going to come, but where he was going to be born, the, 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 the prophesying, all of this, way before it ever took place and happened. And, and the only person who knew that it was going to happen at a specific set time was God himself. And so it was not until the angel came and, and, and came to, to Mary. Remember when uh, we, look at, uh, we, we look at Abraham and when God was specifically giving a date that, uh, that uh, Isaac or Sarah would be pregnant and Isaac would be born. And, uh, and I'll give you an example of that in Romans the ninth chapter verse 9. It says this, for this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah will have a son. Then the Bible also tells us that there's going to be a set time that God has for himself. Nobody else knows it. Even Jesus doesn't know it. And that set time is that when Jesus will come back the second time. He'll come back, the Bible talk, talks about and tells us that there is a period of time and we don't know when that time is going to be, that when, that then when Jesus will appear, a trumpet blast will sound and all of those that are alive, that are believers, will be caught up in the air. All of those that have died and go on, uh, have, have, have uh, gone on to be with the Lord, they, their bodies will be resurrected first and then we who are alive will be caught up in the air with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that nobody knows that time. It's going to be an unexpected time. Nobody knows. Not even Jesus knows that time. J Jesus won't know when to do that until the Father just taps him on the shoulder and says, It's time. And then he will appear in the sky. And those of us that are believers will be caught up with him. Those of us that, that honor the Lord, fear the Lord, and live for him, we will be caught up in the air. And then, and then we'll see the earth go through a horrendous, incredible time uh, of tribulation on, on this earth. It literally, the word keros, it means a time that you do not neglect. It means it's a time that you've got to be on guard. You've got to be ready uh, for that particular set time and that moment. You can't go to sleep. It's a moment that you've got to seize the moment. You can't let it slip by. You can't let it, you, 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 you can't forget it. And you've got to be aware that it's there. And you've got to take advantage and be ready for that at that particular period of time. It, it, it's like, um, 
it's like uh, Black Friday. Okay? There it is. There's the sale. You know what's going to happen. But if you miss it, you've missed it. Tax-free weekend. You can't go in on Monday and say, I was out of town. Can I still get tax-free? Nope. No, it's, it, it's, a, it's a moment, it's a, it's, it's, it's a moment that is set in time. It's a moment that you will not forget. It's a moment of something that has happened or will happen that is etched on the inside of your heart. Let me give you a Keros moment. 9-11-2001. That's a Keros moment. That is a moment that is etched in our minds and our hearts. The scenes, everything that we saw is, 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 is there. And we'll never forget it. There was a, a Keros moment uh, for, for my family, for my wife and I and, and our kids and, and our whole family. And that was on 12-29-2012, right after Christmas when we found our oldest son dead. He had died. That was a Keros moment. And every one of you sitting in here, you, you probably have Keros moments in your life that you can recall of something that happened, that something was totally, completely unexpected, that interrupted your whole day. You were not expecting it. You didn't know it was going to happen. You didn't know it was going to come. If you had, you would have been prepared for it. Now, sometimes you can prepare for someone that's getting ready uh, to, to go be with the Lord, but other times there is no preparation. Other times you get a phone call or, or, or maybe a Keros moment could be you could walk into work and there is an envelope with a red slip on the inside of it. Or you go to, like some people have, walk up to the door and there's a notice on the door that the plant's been closed. You had no idea it was going to happen. You didn't know what, that that was coming, what, that, what, what was, what was going to happen. There's many times that you've gone out and, and, and you're driving and all of a sudden there's a, a wreck that takes place. You never in your wildest dreams believed that when you left home that day that there was going to, you were going to be involved in an accident. It's something that, boom, that just happens that quick. Just a Keros moment. And you don't forget it. There... there there's going to be in this world, Jesus said, in this world you're going to have tribulation. There are going to be things that happen to us. That's the reason right here Paul is talking about having on the armor of God, the armor of light, being prepared, every single moment being aware. Listen, if you're in the military and, and, and you are deployed or you're downrange, you can't just go to the marketplace Leave your weapon and say, hallelujah, I'm just going to go out and buy me some stuff and see what's going on. No, you're going to be dead. You can't do that. You've got to be aware of everything that is happening around you. Even today in America, because of all the violence, all the craziness that we see by groups and religious fanatics and other people, we, we have got to be aware of our surroundings. We've got to be aware of where we're at and what we're doing at all times. You know, used to, we just, we'd leave the windows open. The windows open, screen, and let the air in, and screen door wide open. Oh, come on in. You do that today? You know, have no idea what devil may show up on your front doorstep or somebody coming in. A, a, a young man here in our church, uh, he, he, uh, his mother goes to our church and just recently he decided that he was going to help somebody and he, he picked up somebody uh, that was homeless and, and wanted to feed them, uh, a young man and a girl. And, 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 it, and when I say this, it doesn't mean that we don't help. We're going to help people. We're going to help the homeless. We're going to do everything we can. But he decided to pick them up. And when he picked them up, the, the, the young man started manifesting demons. And, and, and he told him to calm down. And, and then it started happening again. He told him that he, he just had to get out of his truck. Had his little baby in the back. Had to get out of his truck. And he got out of his truck and... And those demons got a hold of that young man and, and he started walking away and then turned around, took a gun and started shooting. 
and one caught him right in the head. All he wanted to do was help somebody. See, we're living in different days and times. If you haven't, if you're not awake, we're living in a different era, but it's not an era that we're unaware of. It is a day and a time that was prophesied to us before, before this time. It was prophesied to us in the Bible that these days were going to take place. All, all of the, all of the, the, so many of the artists, hip hop, rap, uh, the musical artists, Hollywood, and all, all the things that we're seeing on television right now that, that so many of our young people are just taking in and just, man, feeding themselves and feeding their spirit man and just taking it in, taking it in. They have no idea trying to fit into this society, trying to be cool, want to be accepted by the peers, just all this kind of stuff. They have no idea that behind that is principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that is working to get them into a place that they can destroy their lives. So more drugs than we've ever seen and in some places legal, lives being messed up, more alcoholics than ever before. This whole world, when we look at it, is becoming darker and darker. And so many people are so blinded to the darkness, they have no idea. And Jesus said, one of the things that he said before I return, he said there's going to be great deception. He said there's going to be many people that are going to be deceived. And then the, the saddest thing is, is that God says in 1 Timothy, the 4th chapter, and 2 Timothy, the 4th chapter, that before Jesus returns, there's going to be a great falling away from the faith. People are going to look and say, what's church about? It ain't nothing. Man, I want to have, I want to live YOLO. No, that's wrong too. You don't only live once. You live forever. You live forever. You don't live, just live once. The Bible says it is appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. So you, you live forever and ever and ever. And no such thing. But, but when you listen to, to, to artists that proclaim things like that, and you see them with, with their, their drinks and the girls and the, and, and, and the cars and all that kind of stuff, and so many young people look at that and say, man, that's what I want. But the Bible says, what profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And, and, and so, so there's going to be times... That you're going to have things that are going to happen unexpected. There are going to be attacks. There are going to be ambushes. They're going to come out of the blue. They're going to be unanticipated. And they're going to be unforeseen. And the Bible even tells us how to prepare for those things. So in Matthew, the 7th chapter, verse, verse 24, it says this. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine. In other words, he's talking about the Word of God. Whoever hears the word of God and does the word of God, because the Bible says if you're a hearer only of the word, if all you do is come to church and sit and just listen to me preach, and some of you come, some of you young folks, you're here to listen to me preach because you have to, but in your heart you really don't want to be here. And some of you are just texting right now anyway. So you're not, you, you don't think it's any big deal to listen to me. But there will come that day. That if you don't get your life right and get it built on the Word of God, that you will say, I wish I would have listened to that preacher. And the only reason I say to listen to the preacher is because I happen to be the one in the pulpit. But you will say, I wish I would have listened and taken seriously the Word of God. Because if something happens to you unexpected, out of the blue, and you are no longer here, you'll find out that everything that the Word of God says is true. It is absolutely true. And, and I, I know what people say about this because there's not a lot of preaching or teaching like this in, anymore. And I know people say this. They say, well, you're just trying to, say, to scare people. Hey, hey, listen, I, I'm not the one that said it. Jesus said it. I'm not the one. Jesus is the one that preached about hell. A 
Well, I, I will tell you this. If I didn't love you and did not care about you, I'd preach you a message that would tickle your ears and preach you a message that would appeal to your flesh. But there would be no substance to it. I could preach to you that would appeal to your soul and your senses. But not go in and build and make strong your spirit. Now, I can't do that. I've got to tell you the truth. This, this, this whole thing shutting down. This whole thing in this earth is coming to an end. And, and, and I've got to do everything I can, and we all have got to do everything we can to tell people it's time to wake up. It, 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 it's time to understand where, what time you're living in. Amen? So he says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. So if you're building your, if you're building your life upon the word of God, you are a wise man and woman. He said, a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came... And the winds blew and beat on that house. Notice that the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall because it was founded on a rock. Notice that the house did not know when the rain was going to come. It didn't know when the winds were going to come. It didn't know what was going to happen that was going to come to beat on that house. And we're not just talking about the elements. There's a lot of things that try to come in to your house to beat your house down and beat your house up. To lead you astray. The devil's not stupid. He's put together a whole array of things to bring people into deception. He's got it from music to science to all kinds of things. To try to deceive people to believe uh, in, in what he wants to preach instead of what the word of God says. He says it was founded on a rock. That's the reason so many of you are turning out for the discipleship classes. Because you are recognizing and discerning the day and the time that we're living in. And instead of entertaining your flesh and feeding and clothing your flesh, you're feeding your spirit. You're building your spirit man up. You want to have your house strong. That no matter what comes, hell or high water, you're going to be strong. You're not going to be swayed, compromised, pulled away. And you're not going to be blown away. So he says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended and the sand basically is everything that we've tried to build our life on uh, that's in this world today instead instead of the word of God. He said, the winds came, blew, beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now, when, G, when Paul said it is high time, it's time for us to wise up, he said, you can't be asleep because our salvation is nearer than it's ever been before. What, again, what is he saying? I'll repeat myself many, many times today because I really want you to hear it. I really want you to get this. What is he saying? He's saying the return of Jesus is at hand. That's what he said. He said, our salvation, the return of Jesus, our deliverance from all of this, he said, it is at hand. It is here right now. It is closer than it's ever been before. See, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 36, he said, but the day and the hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only He's talking about his return, Jesus coming back to this earth to receive his church. He said, but as, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be coming the Son of Man. So what he's saying is, just the way it was with Noah is going to be the same identical atmosphere and environment when Jesus came. Now, now, now that tells me there's an urgency on the inside of me and there should be an urgency on the inside of every one of us that are believers to not to be afraid to tell people about the love of Jesus and about the love of God. Because... Noah preached, it took, him, it took him over 100 years to build the ark. He preached, and he preached, and he preached, and everybody laughed at him, mocked him, ridiculed him, thought he was just an old man that was out of his mind, and he was building a boat, and it had never rained on the earth. 
He was building a boat and there was nothing to float the thing on. And everybody thought he was crazy. Just like when you get up and you start telling people a lot of times about Jesus and about the Lord coming back. And they think that they just laugh at you and think you're crazy. They laughed at, at Noah until the first thunderbolt came. And the sky started kind of feeling. And the earth erupted and the waters sprang from up. From in. You know when Noah was doing all this, you, you, you know that it had never rained on the earth. Everything was watered from underneath. It was an underground irrig- irrigation system. So they didn't even know what rain was. So when all this began to happen, fear struck their hearts. And the same thing you're going to see that happened with the, the ten virgins is the same thing that you know happened with the folks with Noah. You know that when that when everything erupted and water started coming from everywhere, they were banging on the door saying, let us in. All the thing they were caring about then was they were caring about their self-preservation. They didn't care about God. They didn't care about anybody else. If they got on the boat, they would come back out and still live the evil lifestyle. All they wanted was to be delivered at that time. See, there are going to be people, when Jesus comes back, there's going to, this church probably will not have an empty seat in it after Jesus comes back to receive his people and we're caught up in the air. This, the, the, the largest services that will ever be will be after the return of Jesus. Because all the people that came to church and sit there and listened to us and inside just said, Okay, when's this going to be over, God? How can that man talk that long? Most of them will be down, and they'll probably come running through that door. They'll probably hit right there. They will slide all the way down here, and they will be going, Jesus, God save me, Jesus, 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 Lord God! Jesus! That's the reason that God has chosen the foolishness of preaching. The foolishness of preaching and telling people the truth of the Word of God. Even when the rich man died and went to hell and he looked across the gulf and saw... Abraham Abraham and saw the righteous in Abraham's bosom and he cried out and he said send somebody back from the dead send somebody back I've got brothers I I, I got father Abraham I have brothers you've got to send somebody to tell them let them know this place is real send them send them back if you send somebody from the dead they will know that and Abraham said no they won't No, they won't because they saw Jesus raise people from the dead. Still didn't believe. The Bible says that they watched Jesus stand on a mountain outside of Jerusalem and be caught up into heaven. He went right straight up into heaven. And the Bible says, and there were some there who still didn't believe. They were sitting there trying to figure out, now how did they do that magic? I know there must be an illusionist around here somewhere. They did, that, that couldn't have happened. I, I didn't really see that. That did not happen. So, so, so the, the, the children of Israel, before they went into major sin, they saw all the miracles of God. So faith doesn't come by seeing. Faith comes by hearing and believing the word of God. So, so he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so also will become the Son of Man be. For as it was in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, mar- man, they were having a party. They were having a great time. They were having a feast time. They were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Now, that doesn't sound like to me an economic famine. Sounds 
Sounds like to me they're enjoying prosperity. Because if you're living in the Great Depression, you're not going to be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage because you don't got no money to do nothing. <laughs> so he, he said, before the flood came, they were eating and drinking. They were having celebrations, man. They, they were having parties. I mean, it was going on. And he said, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Listen to this. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. I don't know what's going to happen to anybody that's in the city. Because it doesn't say that. It just says in the field. So I guess we'll make sure I'm standing in the field. Um, so... Then, then the two men, will, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. In other words, he's not, he's not given a representation that Jesus is like a thief, but he's saying Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. You don't know when he's going to come. You know, you don't know when a thief is going to show up. If you did, you'd be sitting in the house waiting for him. You'd be prepared, ready to do it. But he said, you don't know when that day is going to happen. You don't know when he's going to show up. So he's saying we got to be prepared. we got to wake up. we got to know the day and the hour. we got to live the way God wants us to live and quit fooling around and messing around and living like this world as if Jesus will never return in my lifetime. So he, so he said, if he'd have known he'd have washed and the house wouldn't be broken into, therefore you also, turn to your neighbor and say he's talking about you now. You also be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Get ready. Get ready. Jesus said this long before Bishop Jakes picked this up. Jesus is the original, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Be ready, be ready, be ready, be prepared. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Then he goes on to Matthew 25, and he says this, then the, in verse 1, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be like, now notice, and here's something that's very important. He didn't say the kingdom of earth. He said, the kingdom of heaven shall be. So he's relating that this has to do with heaven. It has to do with the people of and a part of that belong to and will be and supposed to go to heaven. So he said, it will be likened into ten virgins who took their lamps. Notice that all of them are virgins and all of them have lamps. To meet the bridegroom. Notice that every one of them knew the bridegroom would come back. They knew the bridegroom would show up, but they did not know what time he would show up. It is, it is almost like on the day of Pentecost when 500 believed the word of God and went to the upper room on the day of Pentecost and they had to wait and wait and wait. 380 of them said, forget this. I'm not waiting any longer. I don't believe it's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. I'm out of here. 120 stayed there because God said it was going to happen. So they stayed. Then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and 120 of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. 380 of them missed the visitation of what God had for them. So he said, he said now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was, now watch this, while the bridegroom was delayed, he was delayed. You know, it's, like, it's like when you begin to preach about the return of Jesus, and everybody kind of, yeah, yeah, we've heard that. Mm -hmm. Yep, we've heard it. We've heard it. But I will tell you this. When God puts tears in my eyes and when God puts an urgency where my heart is beating like I've been eating MSG. And he says, you teach this and you teach it now. 
Because if, 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 if a preacher or a pastor does not teach concerning the days that we're living in and how close we are to the return of Jesus, there's going to be a lot of blood on their hands. And the reason that so many people won't teach this anymore is because Jesus has been delayed for such a long time. But yet at the same time, what I'm getting ready to show you and what you're getting ready to hear is that even though he's been delayed, everything that he said that was going to happen before he came back is happening right now. And it's happening in multiples. It is happening all over the world. And he said, and, and he, he said, but while the broom, bridegroom delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at the midnight, at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. And then the, all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish one said to the wise, give me some of your oil for our lamps are going out. See, I can't give you the spirit in me. You've got to have it for yourself. I can't keep the fire burning on the inside of you. You've got to keep it burning. You've got to fan the flame. You've got to stir up the gift. Oh, I can stir you up right now. But are you going to stay stirred up? Are you going to stay on fire? What are you going to do to have the same passion that I have? What are you going to do to keep the fire that I have. You know, I have pastors say, uh, when are you going to retire? I will retire the moment you see me laid out right here. And they're doing my, and they're doing my home going service. That's when I'll rest. Until then, I still work out. I still got energy. I can still run and not be weary. I can walk and not faint. I can mount up with wings as eagles. You know why? Because I have something on the inside of me that quickens my mortal body. I'm not strong in myself. I'm strong in the Lord and the power of His might. God is not looking for my strength. He's looking for my weakness that He turns into His strength. That's the reason there is no such thing as retiring. Only from your job, that's great, but never from the kingdom of God. That's the reason when you guys get out of the military, I will not let you stop PT. I call it PTL, praising the Lord. (laughs) Amen. We need you. We need every one of you. We need you to live. And the foolish said, give me some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, no, nope, can't do that. Least, what he said, least there should not be enough for us to go. But you rather go to those who sell, buy for yourselves. And while they went and, and to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him to the, uh, to the uh, wedding. And the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins, isn't it exactly what happened to Noah? After the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Notice, now listen folks, please understand this. Notice that what did they say? What did they call him? Say it again. They called him Lord. They called him Lord. Lord, Lord. Did you know Matthew the 7th chapter, it says there will be people who show up. And they, they'll say, Lord, Lord, we cast out devils in your name. Now, folks, listen to me, regardless of what you believe in your doctrine. But let me just say this, because you can find this out in Acts the 19th chapter. In Acts the 19th chapter, you find out that there were seven sons of Sceva. You can't cast out a devil unless they know who you are in the kingdom. Because the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast out the devil out of the man. And he says, Paul I know, Jesus I know, who in the world are you? And the devil jumped out of the man and beat them up and stripped them naked. First streakers in the Bible. Beat them up. Paul cast the devil out. So therefore, if somebody without the power... 
tries to cast the devil out, it ain't going to work. And so the Bible says in Matthew, the seventh chapter, there will be people show up and say, we cast out devils in your name. We prophesied in your name. We actually did signs, wonders, and miracles in your name. And Jesus looked at them and said, depart from me. I never knew you. Now here's the key. You who practiced sin. There's not a one of us in here that doesn't make mistakes. There's not a one of us in here that at times have, have not sinned. I mean, if just the other day, if you gossip about somebody, you just sinned. You thought I was going to say something sexual, but we forget about those sins. If, if, you, if, you, if you lied to somebody, that's a sin. But here's the key. The key is this. He said, if you practice on a regular basis, you practice sin, no matter how much power you got, no matter what you do, if you practice sin and dishonor my name and continue to live that type of lifestyle, he said, when you stand before me, I'm going to say, you're going to say, Lord, 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 Lord. And he's going to say, uh-uh, because you practice this. See, we, t -t today, because of the 21st century, we have taken the standard of God and lowered it down in our preaching and teaching. We've taken that standard and lowered it, lowered, low, lowered it down so that we can live the life of the flesh that we want to live. And we say grace covers that. God has never lowered his standard. That's the reason he came to live on the inside of us so that we could live according to what he's called us to live. And do what he's called us to do. But to do that, you've got to have a love for God. You've got to hate sin and love God. See, if you want to be more anointed than people around you, you want to be the most anointed of all, and we're all anointed as believers. But if you really want to see that anointing flowing, then you read Hebrews, the first chapter where it says this. He said, I have anointed you above your companions because you have loved righteousness and you've hated sin. He didn't, hate, he didn't say he hated the sinner. He said he hates the sin. He loves the sinner. If he didn't love the sinner, you and I would be... We'd be in big trouble. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. He loves every single person, but He hates sin. Sin's what put His Son on the cross. Sin's is what brought His Son to this earth and crucified His Son. Sin did that. So the very thing that God delivered me out of, I hate it. And a lot of people will never get delivered of certain things in their life because they still love it instead of hating it. You won't be delivered from anything until you hate it. You despise it. And once you hate it, you'll do something about it. But as long as you still like it and love it, nothing will change. So he said, so the other, other version said, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he said, answered, surely I say to you, I do not know you. And then he says in this in verse 13, watch therefore... For you need know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. See, Jesus told us in Matthew, the 16th chapter, he said this to, to the people that he was teaching to that day. He said, listen, he said, it's amazing. You can discern when the sky turns red at night, and you'll say, hey, it's going to be a beautiful day tomorrow. And it comes up and it's red in the morning, you can say, we're going to get some rain, there's going to be some clouds. He said, you can discern the weather, you can discern the seasons, leaves are falling off the tree. It's going to be fall. You can discern the, the, the seasons, but he said you can't discern the signs of the time. And the only reason we don't discern the signs of the time is because we, we've, we've started slumber. We've, we've, a lot of the church has become lukewarm. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm, I'm actually talking about the 11 o'clock service. <laughs> he said many, many of the people... <laughs> Now, I'll tell 11 o'clock service I'm talking about y'all. So, anyway, he said, he, he said, many people will get lukewarm, just like the Laodicea church. They'll be more interested in money and things and the world than the world of things of God. And there's nothing wrong. God wants to prosper you. God wants to bless you. But you've got to realize that you and I are not owners of anything. We are stewards 
of what God has given us. And as we steward that and we're faithful to it, God will continue to, uh, to bless us. So, so he said, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the times. In 1 John, the second chapter, in verse 18, he says this, little children. Now listen to this. This is John writing on the Isle of Patmos. This is before, this is before John is going to die. He said, little children, it is the last hour. If John said, back then it's the last hour, what do you think it is right now? It must be the last second. He said, as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which you know that it is the last hour. And this is what really gets me. He said, he's talking about the different Antichrist people are against Jesus and gets right. He said, they went out from, up, from among us. Whoa. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been with us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that there were none of them that were of us. And then he goes on and says, but you have this anointing. And then Jesus said this in Matthew the 24th chapter. He said this in verse 3. He said, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when all of these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and... The end of the age. So there's two things that he's saying there. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So there's two separate uh, statements that they're making there. And Jesus discusses both of them. But first he starts, he starts out with his coming. He said, take heed that no one deceives you. Don't let anybody lead you in error. Don't, don't, don't get into false doctrine. That's the reason that, again, you're coming on Wednesday nights. You're laying the foundation that is so vitally important. For many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all of these things must come to pass and the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation. I mean, you look at it right now. You've got Islamic nations that's coming against ISIS. Nation will rise up against nation. Kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places, and all these will begin to the, will be the, the beginning of sorrows. In other words, the word sorrows, that all this will begin, begin the beginning of birth pains. Birth pains of what? Travail. Birth pains. Birth pains of a new order that's coming in. A new heaven and a new earth. The rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. All the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. He said all those things will take place. Let me, as we're closing, let me give you some statistics before we go because I want you to hear some things. We've had 150 major wars in the world since World War II. Right now, there are 190 nations embroiled in some sort of conflict. Earthquakes from the year 100 to 1800 which is a 1,700-year period, there were 21, only 21 major earthquakes in a 1,700-year period. Between 1950 and 1991, there were 93 major earthquakes. We now have an average of one major earthquake per year of a magnitude of 8 or higher. 17 of a magnitude of eight, a 7 to 8. 134 of a magnitude of 6 to 7. 1,300 of a magnitude of 5 to 6. This is the beginning of birth pains. Approximately 10 million people die every year due to famines and pestilence. And in the last 30 years, and it just said the other day, just the other day on the news, there is a new virus that they have no idea. They have no idea where it came from. They don't know what to do with it. 30 new diseases and viruses in the last 30 years that have come into the world. Persecutions, 163,000 believers were martyred last year and the number is growing and that does not even count what happened in Syria. And you can see right here, it is time to wake up. And I don't know if you've, just, if you've heard recently, but over 200 Christians have now been kidnapped. And if you haven't heard what they're doing with the children, it is time to wake up. Do you think it's time for us to come to prayer on Saturday night? It's time to wake up. Let me just say this to you. Let me just say this. Listen to this. To put fear in the, the villages, day before yesterday, they were talking about 
that they are now crucifying the children. Little kids crucifying them and leaving them out. This is evil persona. Beyond our comprehension. But yet the Bible tells us that we're living in days like this. The Bible even tells us that there will be kingdom against kingdom. And what are we doing? We're over here just kind of, not everybody, but a lot of places, a lot of churches, we're just sleeping. Oh, I don't have time for prayer. I don't have time for the word. I don't have time to get involved. I don't have time to do all this stuff. I got... Now they're saying that they want to come to our malls, come to everything. And, and by the way, talk about living in a city. We're living in a city that has a fort that orchestrates the war on terrorism. terrorism. You think you need to be praying about your city? Or, oh, I don't know. Oh, oh. pastor's praying. Somebody else is praying. I don't need to be involved in all that kind of stuff. i got to watch my show as the, as the stomach turns, comes on at whatever time i got to watch it. 163,000 believers, and this is not even counting what they can't count in Syria. Jesus said that Christians would be hated by all nations. Christians are being targeted and persecuted like never before. Why? Because here's what Jesus said. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. Jesus said in John, the 15th chapter, he says, The world will hate you. If it hated me, it's going to hate you. Three groups that will be hated. Radical Islam, terrorism, Israel, and true Christians. Because the new hate speech is truth. Truth is falling in the streets. You're going to speak the truth and tell the truth, you're going to be hated. Look at all the whistleblowers today and exposing things in our government. Hated. Now, I, I, I don't know this. I, I'm, just, I'm just kind of speculating. But, you know, in, in, in reading what I read in the news the other day about... Uh, about this guy that was getting ready to run for governor in Missouri. And he was getting ready to expose a lot of corruption. And, and he was on fire, ready to go. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he just commits suicide. We're living in different times. We're living in different times. Dangerous times. This is not a day and a time that you won't be playing games with God. This is not a day and a time that you want to have one foot right here on Sunday and then the other foot out there in the world enjoying all the things of the world when nobody is watching you, when God is seeing everything uh, that, 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 we, that we do. The Bible tells us there's going to be a rise in immorality, evil, violence, and sorcery. Before the return of Jesus as it was in the days of Noah and the days of Solomon and Gomorrah. And we're seeing that. And you can read that in Romans, the first chapter, verse 18 through 32. Harry Potter books. Because of Harry Potter books, children and young people have been introduced to demonic spells and curses. There are now over 80,000 registered practicing witches in England. Drugs have now filtrated every, almost every city and town neighbor, and neighborhood in America. Our prisons are full and we're bring, building more as quick as possible because we can't hold the number of people. We're turning out people left and right that are going out and committing horrendous crimes. Pornography is running rampant on the internet. There are approximately 250 million porno websites a segment of society spends $57 billion a year in pornography in America. $3 billion on child pornography. $4.5 billion on phone sex. $2.5 billion on, on, on pornographic emails. 27,000 people visit pornographic websites every second in America. 
27 million people crossed the international date line to protect to, to partake of sex trafficking. And the large sex trafficking event in the world is the Super Bowl, and number two is the World Cup. I say to you, in closing, do you know what time it is? Do you know what time it is? Are you going to wake up? Or are you going to listen to this, go out, and just life as usual? Or are we going to examine ourselves and look at ourselves and say, where am I in my walk with Jesus? What am I doing? You know? What am I looking at on those websites? Am I, full, am I addicted to pornography? Am I addicted to drugs? Am I addicted, addicted what, to what? Am I addicted to lust? Am I addicted to Whatever. That has become an idol in my life. That I'm putting it before my relationship, my walk with Jesus. And, and if you're doing that, you're playing Russian roulette. And it's, re- it's really crazy. Because this flesh that you live in is going to fight for what it wants. It's going to fight you. The Bible tells that. You know, the Bible says that. The Bible says your flesh fights against and wars against your spirit man on the inside. It fights, but really it has no power over you unless you empower it and you give it power. And we have to ask ourselves, no matter how young you are or how old you are, how am I living my life? This is a day and a time that we've got to do a checkup from the neck up. We've got to look at ourselves, and the Bible says examine yourself to see if you're in faith. We have to do a self-examination. The Holy Spirit will help us. God will help us because He loves us. And the moment that I see things in my life that are leading me away from God or causing me to be lukewarm, and I look at it and say, I hate this, God, I hate this. At that moment, there is an empowerment that will help you at that particular period of time. And if you're not born again, if you've not received Jesus as the Lord of your life, or maybe you knew Him at one time, but you've gotten away from Him and you've allowed people to pull you away and influence you, that you're not living your life totally sold out, 100% for Jesus. And I'm not saying that we don't, again, we don't make mistakes. I mean, there's times in my life I make mistakes, but I'm not practicing Sin. I'm not practicing immorality. I'm not practicing things like that. I have a fear of God on the inside of me. And it's not because I'm a preacher. Because there's preachers who are going to stand before the Lord. And he says, get out of here. I never knew you. It's not because I'm a preacher. It's because I'm a son of the living God. I am a child of God. The Bible says, flee from youthful lust. You have the power to delete anything that comes up on your computer. You have the power to delete it. You don't have to go in that chat room. You don't have to go to farmers.com. You don't have to go to singles.com, seniors.com, whatever .com there is, there's every kind of .com out there. You don't have to go to all that stuff. You're the one that makes the decision to do it. The Bible says if you're married, you are to love the the wife of your youth. And if you start praying for your marriage and start praying for that instead of being so selfish, stinking selfish about what you want for yourself, if you start praying for your marriage and start praying, God, give me a heart. Give me a heart for you and give me a heart for my wife. God will answer that prayer. He'll turn it around. He'll change it. It's time to wake up. The Bible says, Jesus said also, that I read a while ago, he also said this. He said, many will be offended. Now, you can be offended at me right now. That's between you and God. You can hate me and be offended at me and wish that I would shut up. I've already gone way past the time that we're supposed to let out. Parking lot will be unbelievable. (laughs) You're going to have to find out how much love you can drive in. (laughs) But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm burning with this on the inside. 
I am burning with this on the inside because I know, I know Jesus, I know Jesus, I know Jesus is on the verge of coming back. Because everything I'm telling you, and here we are in strife and bickering and arguing and all this kind of stuff. And there are brothers and sisters that are, that, are, that are being martyred and heads cut off and crucified and burned alive every single day. And we're arguing about the most petty of things. Stop it in Jesus' name. Love one another, care for one another, pray for one another. Get your eyes off of other women and other men and get your eyes where it needs to be on Jesus. And say, I'm sorry and forgive me and get it right. It's not the day and the time for you to harbor unforgiveness and this little petty stuff. Nobody has threatened to cut your head off yet. To find out who the real Christians are. It's time to get our lives in alignment with the Word of God. 